Hi, how's, how's everybody doing? Okay. Uh, once again, my name is Carl Soule from Adobe. Um, I'm just going to kind of run through a few of the different features and uh, some of the workflows that uh, Van talked about on the panel a little bit, but please feel free to raise hands and uh, I'll be happy to answer questions. I'm going to be going a little bit fast just for time purposes, just to kind of get through everything we want to talk about. Um, kind of to build on uh, a little bit of what we were just talking about with, uh, with some of the VR stuff that's happening. Um, that is one of the new workflows that we did add to Adobe Premiere uh, in the last release. Um, there's some things that you can do natively directly inside of Premiere and After Effects dealing with uh, 360 content, VR content. Um, there is a really, really good set of plugins that Van mentioned, uh, Metal Skybox. Um, for people who are doing this on a regular basis, um, that is definitely uh, a great set of tools that kind of add on to the overall experience. If you haven't gotten a chance to play with any of the 360 or VR content, um, you can pick up the headsets now for your phone for like 20 bucks at Best Buy. This is something even smaller. This is something I picked up from uh, one of the content producers, a company in LA called Jaunt. They make an app for the phones that uh, allow you to just put this on. And then you get to look as cool as I am right now by holding your phone up and walking around and being able to look at content. But there's some really amazing stuff out there. I mean, you know, in, in addition to the experience stuff, we are starting to see some narrative storytelling happening. So things like, anybody here watch the show Mr. Robot? There's actually a mini episode for VR that's actually one of the best examples of kind of building onto you know, an existing property. And uh, that's really where we're seeing a lot of the VR content now, is people are either doing an experience of a particular location or um, they're kind of building onto an existing property. We saw a lot of content with Star Wars, with Rogue One, with The Force Awakens, um, and it definitely just keeps people engaged with the, uh, with the overall content. Um, as far as Premiere is concerned, and as far as the Adobe tools are concerned, we really haven't gotten into this idea of stitching multiple cameras together because that is just changing so rapidly. There are rigs that you can buy that take like six GoPro cameras shooting in different angles and you have to take all of that footage and bring it into a tool which then builds it out into an image that kind of looks like this. This is what we call equirectangular footage. Now, when you're looking at the footage in this format, and by the way, the resolution of clips in this format, um, right now we're seeing a lot of people shooting in 4K. Um, if you're doing stereoscopic with left eye and right eye footage, we're seeing a frame that's 4K by 4K. I'll show you that in a second. Um, and they're saying that to get rid of some of the barn door effects with the bigger headsets as this technology evolves, kind of the holy grail for this is gonna be 8K per eye. So if you think 4K is enough, this is one of those areas that we are going to see, you know, rapid development and from a storage perspective, you know, being able to store these files um, is going to get, going to get a little crazy. Um, viewing the footage in this format, this equirectangular format, it can be really difficult to figure out what the, where the action is. And so what we've actually done now is we've introduced a VR viewer directly inside of Premiere for the program monitor and the source monitor. So if I want to go in and kind of see, you know, what this woman is doing here, she's doing something, ooh, that's, that's really, uns that's a safety railing she's jumping off of there. Um, yeah, not the brightest thing to do, but okay. Um, but you can see what the, uh, what the, the viewing experience is um, by being able to pan around we have uh, some on-screen controls. If you want to have a more precise panning experience where you have a, a knob to specifically you know, pan around on the y-axis, you can do that as well. Now this also works with stereoscopic footage. If I go to a different timeline here, this is where we start getting into this 4K by 4K aspect. So we actually have two 4K images stacked one on top of the other. Again, we can go in and we can actually view this in a, uh, a pan around experience. And something that we added for specifically for 3D content, I can choose between looking at left eye, right eye, or if I have the old red and blue glasses lying around someplace, I can actually choose an anaglyph mode 
and Premiere will let me uh, see this and kind of check the, uh, the stereo convergence and make sure that uh, you know everything looks uh, appropriate as I'm kind of panning around in the experience there. You can kind of see the ghosting from the red and the blue uh, to allow me to see the stereo. So definitely VR is an area we're seeing a, a, gr a big growth in content. I mean, it's still, you're only talking about like, like if you look at the overall use of Premiere, it's like one to 3% of the content out there. Um, but we are seeing quite a bit um, because of the tools with uh, not only Premiere, but the, uh, the plugin tools. I'll just show one quick example of this. If you have a, a clip like this, maybe the starting position of this is wrong. In a lot of cases, when you stitch your footage together, what the viewer starts looking at is not necessarily defined properly in the clip. You've got this array of cameras. Um, you know, here's a really, really simple VR rig. It's two cameras. Um, but in a lot of cases, I've seen these rigs that have 20 cameras. Um, you just have cameras pointed in all different directions. So determining where your starting position is is not something you can do inside of Premiere itself, but this is where the uh, tools for metal come into place, M-E-T-T-L-E. -E. They make not only these uh, utility tools here for kind of changing things, doing things like sharpening and, and glow effects. They also make transitional effects. Um, but if I add like the rotate sphere effect to this clip and go to the effect controls, now, what this is actually gonna do, you can see the center point right now is the Golden Gate Bridge, but maybe I wanna rotate it over to the woman on the side here. I can grab the pan control and move that over. If I wanted to you know, change the tilt, this will actually do the right thing for the spherical view so that uh, you know, now when I jump into the spherical view, this is now my starting position for the, for the footage. Question? You guys getting into HDR? Good question. Um, are we getting into HDR? Um, we have uh, started some work with that and some of the color tools inside of Premiere actually enable you to go in and kind of tinker around and play with HDR. Um, we definitely see something when it comes to general viewing and I got in, in, into a discussion with somebody during the break about uh, 4K versus 8K. We're starting to see you know people talking about 8K as a format. Um, definitely the high dynamic range stuff um, really, really adds a lot of impact. Um, right now we have some very specific workflows. You can actually import in Dolby Vision content, you can cut it. You know, it's, it's mostly designed as something we work with Dolby to present a, uh, uh, a way of doing cut downs. So if they have a full length feature and they need to do like a five minute highlight reel, um, we preserve the HDR metadata track as well as we do everything in a Rec 2020 color space. But those are very, very specific workflows for right now. I wouldn't call Premiere a tool for general HDR use at this point, but we did put some features in that you can kind of tinker with and play around with when we talk about color. And of course we have, you know, the Lumetri color engine uh, from Adobe SpeedGrade is built into Premiere now. So these are all these different uh, controls for working with and actually doing color grading directly inside of Premiere. They're designed to be a lot easier, more intuitive to use than a lot of other types of color tools. We modeled a lot of these controls after Adobe Lightroom. So anybody who knows how to do you know, any type of color work on stills um, can usually jump in here and get started very, very quickly. If you wanna play with HDR, you have to come up to the top of the Lumetri color panel. And there is something where you can turn on here called uh, mm -hmm. high dynamic range. And by doing that, it adds a few extra controls. So instead of having three color wheels, we actually give you a separate wheel for doing HDR specular control, um, as well as a slider where you can define what your HDR white point is actually gonna be. So um, these are still, I would really consider these experimental. Um, I have done some playing around with them. We do have a way of flagging a clip. If you go out using the HEVC codec, um, we can flag a clip so that it will display in high dynamic range on an HDR TV. So there are some tools in there now. I still wouldn't say this is a complete toolkit for doing HDR work at this point. Any other questions? So while we're talking about this idea of 4K, 8K per eye, um, we did have to go kind of take a blast from the past a little bit and dive back into a feature 
um, dealing with uh, proxy based workflows. And um, this was something that uh, in addition to adding a full proxy workflow, we also started to add a little tiny bit of media management into the way Premiere works and the way Media Encoder works. So before I show you the proxy stuff, let me just quickly open up the uh, project settings inside of Premiere. And anybody who uses Premiere has probably seen this project settings box before where you set up, you know, where you want to save your project. Whenever you create a new project, you set up your scratch disks. We introduced this new tab here called the ingest settings tab. And what this is designed to do now is I can turn this on and this really works well for people if you're coming directly off a memory card from a camera. Um, if you import a clip through the media browser, this can define where that clip is going to get copied to. So basically it gives you the ability to edit direct off the memory card during that copy process. It's a background process and as soon as the copy finishes, it'll switch over to where that clip actually is going to live. And so you can define this ingest location. Um, you can choose a location. It's also possible to build a, what's called an ingest preset. Um, and this is something you can do over in the media encoder. You can build it one time there and hand it off to everybody so that you know that your footage is going to go to this specific directory on the shared storage. Um, now this same function also gives you the ability to copy it and at the same time fire off a, a process to create proxy files. So I can create, you know, if I'm shooting on a, you know, a red uh, weapon S35 at 8K, I could kick off a proxy that is, you know, something more akin to maybe 2K, something that I can actually edit and the data rate's gonna be appropriate for, for the bandwidth that I have. Um, so you can use this and you can create, and we, we ship with a series of presets just as some uh, commonly defined workflows, but this is something that you can go in and you can play with um, and make your own presets of however you wanna create proxies. We do recommend keeping the proxy files the same aspect ratio as the source media. So for broadcast, that's typically not a problem. We've got UHD, HD, um, 720p if you needed it, um, all the same aspect ratio. But when you start shooting on film or digital cinema cameras, you get all kinds of crazy aspect ratios. So it's just something to note. You know, if you're gonna shoot on a 6K <coughs> camera, you know, half both the resolutions, that's one possible, quarter both the resolution, you know, the two numbers to get uh, what, what aspect ratio you want to shoot at or what you want to create proxies at. Um, once you do this, your footage is actually linked to two different pieces of media and just by toggling a single button, I'll go ahead and blow this up a little bit more full screen here so you can see this. Here's the high res footage and you can see it's kind of, this is I think 5K red footage and it's chunking along on my laptop here. If I switch over to the proxy, and the reason it says proxy here is I've actually created an ingest preset, so whenever I create the proxies, it'll automatically uh, put that watermark over the top of the footage. Just gives me a nice visual indicator that I'm editing on the proxies. Totally optional, um, just something I do for demo purposes, because seeing the, I think this proxy is 1920 by 1080, or something pretty close to that. So I mean, seeing the resolution difference between the proxy file and the high res footage, it's a little softer. <laughs> um, honestly, when you start working at these different resolutions, unless you've got a huge monitor, um, you know, the proxy files look just as good as the high res um, until you're ready to start outputting. And then if you gotta go to color grading or something like that, you've got, got better files. Yeah. When you say you're starting in a 4K mm -hmm. and then you're coming into a proxy workflow, right. you set up your sequence to be 4K first? Yes. So first very, first. very good question. So um, typically you would set up your sequence in the project to be the resolution of whatever the biggest resolution you want to output to. So if I'm working with... Um, you know, 4K or UHD, but I want to use HD proxies for ease of use, um, I would actually set my timeline up at a UHD resolution. Um, if the editor mixes, say, you're, you're shooting 
thing with Sony that's you know UHD format, but then they throw in some red. Does mm -hmm. that cause an issue? It's Again, that's one of the reasons why we recommend setting the proxy size to be a fraction of what the original source media is. Um, and there's also some cases where you might want the timeline not to match either of those. Like a good example is, you know, F David Fincher's workflow is they're shooting 6K, but he frames the shots for 5K. So he may use a 5K timeline, and then they're actually using 2K proxy files. <laughs> 2K is a proxy? Okay. Um, but the, the whole idea is, you know, they like to reframe things in post. You know, I honestly don't see 8K ever really coming to broadcast transmission outside of places like Japan. Um, but shooting in 8K, you basically, if you're framing for a wide shot, well, you get the medium shot for free. You know, it's like it gives you a lot of in interesting ideas of how you can kind of play around with the footage in post. So, um, I was going to say that in the the creating the timeline to to match what your output is isn't a requirement, but what it does help is if you're doing graphics, placing titles, logos, bugs, any of those things in there, they will maintain scale. So when he clicks that button and links right back to the high res, all of that stuff doesn't have to be readjusted. It didn't, it didn't scale. It's already at the correct aspect ratio. Yeah. On, on your ingest setting, because um, in our workflow, we just recently bought the uh, Apollo 7 from Convergent Designs. Will it um, strip out the wrapper and, sp sp and uh, split it up into the four cameras, or do we still, because currently we still have to use uh, the ProRes unwrapper from Convergent Design, which unpacks the, the uh, MOV file, because it's, it's an MOV file that the four streams are in there, which can only see one stream, and then you have to unwrap it, mm. and splits it up into four, and then bring it back in as an EDL. Now, are you even thinking about um, kind of adding that as a future? I'd have to find out where we're at in that discussion with that particular hardware vendor. Gotcha. Um, it, uh, you know, that sounds like something very specific. So it's actually taking and it's, the video is actually in, in four quadrants in no, separate no, no, streams? No, the video file is actually, a, it's like a, it's an MO, it looks like an MOB, but it's actually a wrapper for all four video files and you only see the oh, edited, right. okay. you only see the edited version and you have to yeah. <coughs> to, to be able to get the four to get the individual four. cameras. So okay. I yeah. I I would tend to think not. I would tend to think you would have to unwrap that first. That's kind of a specialty use case that I would kind of put that under the same category as like the stitching, the need for stitching in VR space. It's something that it's specific to one hardware vendor and whether we would do that, it really depends on, you know, how how much that uh, that particular format and that workflow is done, um, you know, how how much that takes over the industry. If we see a lot of it, we would probably do more of it. Um, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Um, really quickly, um, because I am definitely going to go over time if I keep going at this pace. Um, I wanted to show you guys team projects and. The first thing about this, this is something very specific to anybody who's on an enterprise um, contract or is using Creative Cloud for Teams. This is not currently in beta for Creative Cloud for Individuals. We are keeping it locked to the Teams and the enterprise customers at this point. But if you're on an enterprise account, um, Premiere and After Effects both have the option of going in and opening a, or working with and creating a team project. Now, as Van talked about, a team project actually does live in the cloud. Now, we are not hosting any of your media. Your media stays local. We are only putting the project metadata up in the cloud. So the project where you have sequences, you have a list of your master clips, all of that information exists up in the cloud. And that's one of the ways we can share this really, really quickly back and forth between different people. Um, if I go through and open a team project, I've got one here that is actually assigned to me. I'll go ahead and open this up. Premiere should look pretty much the same way that it always does, and it should actually behave pretty much the same way you would expect. There's only a few small differences when you're working inside of a team project. Um, Looks like somebody just shared, just did some changes to this. So I'm going to go ahead and get the changes. Van, are you playing with this, or is one of the other guys working? Okay. 
All right. Um, let's see what changed. Oh, well, I don't know if you guys saw it a minute ago. This said uh, best document documentary about Miami in years. It looks like somebody just uh, is doing a demo in New York right now with the same team project and just changed the graphic. Um, I will. I will. Um, so a couple of things that you'll see here. Um, up at the top of the project bin, I can actually see who is the owner of this team project, who else has accepted this, and we've actually got a team of probably about 15 to 20 people around the world that are all using this team project for demos. Um, so we can go in and make changes to this. Now, the way this works, I'm logged in based on my Creative Cloud account. So ksule at adobe.com, that is what gives me user rights. If someone wanted to add me to their team project, they would need to know my Adobe ID. They can add somebody uh, to the team project they have. Once, uh, once you're added to this, you can work, and you're basically kind of in a protected sandbox while you're doing editorial work. I can start doing changes to my timeline here. I'm not going to see, nobody else is going to see those changes in the work group until I push those changes live. So I choose when I want to share stuff. So you're kind of in a safe zone where you don't have to worry about someone else seeing what you're doing. And also, you don't have to worry about like a Google Doc where somebody else is editing it at the same time you're looking at it. If you ever have tried to deal with that, it's like a video game where you're kind of dodging. Wait, why is that clip moving on its own? We, we, we tried it. It doesn't work. So, so if I wanted to make a change to this, so let me just come in here. Denver. Oops, I used the wrong font. One second. Let's see. I should have the right font selected. All right. We'll do that. So I've now made this change. Now, if I want to push this out to the work group, all I have to do is click. You'll see there's two buttons down here get latest changes. This is where I saw, I, I clicked that button to see the text change from Miami to New York. Now I'm going to push out my changes. And usually when you do this, you want to make a little bit of a note. Denver rules. <laughs> and we'll click share. And so now everybody else in the work group is going to get that same notification. Now you can make that notification as obnoxious or as subtle as you want. And I've got my system currently set up so that I've got operating system notifications turned off. All I'm going to see when somebody else makes a change is this Get Latest Changes button is going to highlight to tell me that somebody else has pushed out some changes. Um, how obnoxious can you make it? How about on your Apple Watch? <laughs> <laughs> um, this will actually push out notifications. If you have the Creative Cloud app on your watch, um, you will actually, when you're away from your computer, you'll actually see, oh, some, you know, the following person has made changes to the following team project. So, you know. I just got his update. Oh, you just, okay. My title now shows Denver. <laughs> um, the last kind of piece of this, um, first off, uh, media management. Um, everybody's Adobe ID basically tells the team, you know, the team project stores based on your Adobe ID where your media lives. Now, if you're all editing off the same shared storage, that means there's one path to worry about. If you're editing in a, a Windows and Mac environment, that means there's two paths. Um, team projects will remember both paths. Once somebody on a Windows machine opens this up, It'll know that that's the path for Windows. You can now kind of go back and forth between Windows and Mac. You don't have to worry about relinking files or worry about pathing issues. Team projects can also work on co-located media. Very common workflow is to put all the media on a drive, uh, clone it, hand it off to somebody who wants to work remotely. Um, that person will one time have to set their path, because it's probably different from where the shared storage was, um, to set their path for where their media is at. Um, if you combine this with working with proxies, it is, this will of course work with proxies the same way that, that regular Premiere, standalone Premiere will work, 
But you can also put your proxies on something like Dropbox or use your Creative Cloud shared folder so that the proxies will synchronize on multiple editor systems. So if you want to give somebody the ability to do editorial work, but they don't need the high res per se, they're just going to edit off the proxy <coughs> files. Um, you could set your proxy location and set your media destination as um, you know, something like a Dropbox folder. And at that point, everything, as soon as their files sync, they'll be able to open up the project and, and edit using the proxy files. All right, the very last thing I want to show you here is in the media browser panel. And you'll notice if I go into the media browser, you'll see that there are actually team projects showing up here inside of the media browser. So we see some people actually use the media browser to kind of organize motion graphics elements. It's possible to put all of those in a team project. And you kind of, as a rule, you treat it like a read-only team project so that people can go in and pull um, assets. You have maybe one person who owns it who goes in and actually what they do need to do branding updates or changes, they'll go in and do that. But you can have one location that's very easy to access um, via a team project um, to get into and, uh, and work with those types of assets. Now you can also use this to go back in time within any team project. So here I am in the same team project I'm currently in. We have a slider here called the team project history slider. And each of these little check boxes or these little tick marks along this line here represent a change somebody has made in the history of this project. So if I go back in time, I can see, okay, Dave Helmley changes to New York City, add to red. Uh, Gustavo did some changes. I made a trim. I can literally go all the way back to November. And if I want to see this without actually like reverting back to it, I can just open it over in the source monitor. Oh, it's supposed to be Argentina. Well, that makes more sense. Okay. <laughs> so that doesn't look like Denver so, um, or New York. So um, this gives me the ability to actually go back through the history of this and I can kind of do sort of a visual side-by-side -side comparison you know, of what this looked like from, one, uh, from an earlier version of the, uh, of the same sequence. Now because we remember all of these different versions and go back in time, if I wanted to swap this sequence out with the older sequence and maybe say, okay, we're going to go back, you know, ever lose the narrative on something and say, I, we need to go back to yesterday because we're just kind of, kind, of, kind of got off a cliff here. Um, you can do that, delete the one that you don't want to move forward with. You're still going to have a copy of that back in the history. If something, somebody says, well, wait, we did that one thing for that one scene. Can we go back and get that? You still have the ability to do that. So it kind of encourages editors to keep their project files, you know, what is in the project bin relatively clean because you can just delete stuff knowing that you can always go back and get it if you need it. All right. A lot of questions. <laughs> I just wonder, is this free is if you have the enterprise license or is there an additional subscription? Right now, um, Right now we have this, we're, we're still calling it beta because there's one big feature that's missing. Um, I mentioned that you can do this in both Premiere and After Effects. It's actually one team project with After Effects artists working in that same team project with Premiere editors. Um, the key thing that we have shown that is not currently shipping, but we're hoping to address that this year, is the ability to dynamically link your After Effects composition. You'll be able to drop it into a Premiere sequence. Like you can, in, you know, in a normal standalone Premiere, you can bring in After Effects files. For some reason, that's not yet working with team projects. So we're still kind of calling it beta, but we have people actively using it. Um, just be aware that's the one kind of missing feature. If you use a lot of After Effects files, you want to use those in, with a team project, you just have to render them out to a video clip and then import them into the sequence. And it'll so work. It's not beta anymore, will be an additional subscription? There's no extra cost for it. No, no extra cost. Oh, okay. Yeah. How do you tell, uh, as a part of your enterprise license, other than just knowing um, who's available to participate in a team project and you know, pull down or something for all the people that, who are you know, default in your group? Well, you create the group. Um, it's based on the Adobe IDs within right. your group. 
Yeah. Go ahead. Do you have the ability now, because I'm sure you have a good team project lead, they'll say, hey, work on this section or this section. Do you have the ability to, like, if you're working on a current section like you have in that timeline right there, to lock somebody out to keep them from making changes in somewhere else that two people might be simultaneously working on the same section? The good, same good question. Um, Team Projects doesn't have any type of locking feature because we actually manage conflict resolution at the end. So if Dave made, I'm pretty sure that was Dave that made the change and made this, the graphic, the title here say New York. Um, if he changed it to New York and I changed it to Denver, it's kind of in an order of who did it first. But now here's the key thing. Um, if neither of us, if, we, if I go to push my changes and I'm saving over the top of what Dave had just done, there's a dialogue screen that comes up on screen. Dan, you want to? Oh, you, okay. Um, I don't want to run into quantum stack. Yeah. It, it will. It won't let you overwrite what each, what each other's done. It asks you to make a copy, so then you can add dot one your your date initials, however you want to iterate it. Um, so it, yeah. it, we didn't want to under thinking about locking, although we we may add it at some point. Um, it lets you kind of work fluidly, and then it, at the end, if two people have worked on it, it says, oh, you know, there's two people. There's a conflict. The sequence lets you make a copy now. We're not proposing working on the same sequence at the same time. Is it's typically lack of communication more than yeah. anything else. But it won't let you hurt. It won't let you hurt yourself in, in that process. Though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's good. And then the last quick question. So you got multiple team users. Uh, the media points it can be stored in multiple locations, and it's accessing all that. Or a absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So yeah. it, it, it may at some point we may stream the proxies from the cloud. We're looking at that. Um, but right now, if you have someone on a local drive that's working at home and someone at altitude that's working on the shared storage, they can each have their own path that remembers those so it doesn't ask you each time. Because my next question was, then we do DR and we go ahead and we offload content, mm -hmm. try to protect the RAID, and I'm thinking, how do you bring this back? How do you coordinate that? Uh, yeah, it'll remember, like, I think it's the last four places that media was and look for all of them, and if it doesn't find it after four or five tries, it goes, Tell me where it is. And yeah. And the last thing from an archive perspective as well, if you want to just create a local project, at any point when you're creating or working with team projects, you do have the ability to create, turn a local project into a team project, turn a team project into a local project. So, um, you know, there's no, no concern. For, for archival purposes, that would probably be the direction I would go, is create a local project and then you, you know, can manage the media from, from that point. Yeah, it also, if you do lose an internet connection, it lets you keep working, it lets you export, it'll just resync it back up. So if you're up on the ski lift or wherever you might be, <laughs> what are you saying? In the plane. Yep. Uh, yep. So. Well, this car okay. stops at 1 o'clock, anybody? So it did location, we can stay in a little longer if we need to park. Please do have questions. I just cut my presentation by 10 minutes. Uh, so go ahead. Okay. A couple more questions. We'll, we'll, we'll stick to 1 o'clock and stop. So you said there's no control at all as far as who does what. Say if you do a rough cut and then you hand off the project to somebody of color, can you say you can no longer do timing edits while the other guy does the final timing edit? We're not really managing that on a project level at this point. Okay. Um, so you can't just kind of split off functionality and then merge it at the end. And, you know. Yeah, there's there are some ways around that by. Uh, you know, just depending on the types of tools that you want to use and, uh, um, you know, this will still work with things like XML workflows if you're going in and out of Adobe tools. Um, if it's, it's something we could be done. I mean, philosophically, it's dangerous. Like a lot, a lot of sports producers in the room, if, if you're trying to get something out and somebody locked it and then now you're running down the hall screaming, you know, it, it, so there, there's, there's trade-offs to it. doesn't mean we shouldn't allow it, but... Philosophically, at this point, we just some control to keep your uh, intern from deleting your clips. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. The <laughs> nice thing is you can't delete anything. You can select all, hit delete, delete the entire project, go back into history, and everything's right there. Mm -hmm. Really nice. Actually, save is disabled. There's exactly. no save. It automatically saves everything you do. Yeah. 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 I think there was yeah. three in the cloud. The last time you turned on the program. Yeah. So you're. 
you're constantly, if, if you're connected to the cloud, everything that you're doing, every change that you make, um, there isn't even a need to save. Basically, everything you're doing is, is just updating. Um, I was going to show if you, if you quit out of Premiere on one system, sign into the cloud on a different system, and then open the same team project, you'll be at the exact same position you were, and you'll see the, uh, you know, share my changes button will be active, meaning that there's unshared changes. So you're actually in this protected sandbox regardless of what computer you're working on. Um, when you push your changes live, that becomes part of that production history that you now have created a point that you can go back to. Um, but you know, it, it does give you some protection. If a computer just suddenly s starts smoking and explodes, <laughs> well, everything is actually still on the cloud from the, the last moment. You know, within a few seconds, it's it, you know, depending on your internet connection, sometimes there can be a, a delay of up to 20 seconds. But for the most part, where you're at is is what's on the server. So you don't have to push it out. It auto, like it's basically an auto save. Yeah, it's okay. it's just auto saving so all the time. If it crashes midstream. Whatever, whenever it automatically pushed out. When you reload the, when you reload Premiere, reload your team project, you'll be at that same location again. Gotcha. And, that, and that's just for the work you're actively doing. Until he hits share changes, nobody else sees the edit I'm doing. So that, that's by design. If you're writing an email, you don't want somebody coming down the hall and saying, I thought we were gonna do this, and you're like, wait, I'm not finished writing it yet. So you're, you're working iteratively, and when you're ready to publish it, that's when you check it into the project, and now everybody has access, so. Yep. So like right now, I just, I just did an audio trim just to kind of match up the, the end of the audio with the end of the video. You can see that this share my changes button is currently live. If I were to quit out of Premiere, log into Van's laptop, I would see this change. Everything would be exactly where I, where I left off for, for, more, for my project. So it does that on a user by user basis. So, so, so as I'm saying philosophically, you know, you would have, let's say, a primary editor you know, somebody working, speeding the audio, somebody working graphics, but you wouldn't technically have, let's say, two editors just because you don't want two egos. Trying to I edit the same, yeah. Typically, yeah. if you break things up in act, scene, segment, yeah. however you organize things, you're still yeah. probably going to assign one of those to each yeah. person, mm -hmm. or, you know, your audio, don't touch my video, yeah. and however you want to manage that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no communication. There's still, humans still have to talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes? Is there a way to mark your master My understanding is that every person that's in this team has their own copy of the media local to them, right? Whether it's an array or a network, doesn't matter. Right, but we're treating all those clips, it's, you know, the clips on disk all are usually referencing the same master clip in the bin. Um, so unless you duplicate something in the bin to say, hey, I need two separate copies of this, or, um, you know, you've taken your media on, has, you've run it through some kind of a process, um, you know, there's you would have to, to relink to that at, at some point. And if just to clarify, if, if five editors here inside the Pepsi Center were all editing on shared storage, there's only one copy of the media. If if one of those is going to take it home, puts it on a FireWire drive and, and, and takes it home, now he's got a separate copy. But otherwise, if you have access to the same media, there only needs to be one copy of that media. Right. I guess I guess my question really is, if I if you have five editors editing and four editors are they're all in satellite offices, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have the master is located in, say, Denver, and the four other satellite offices can delete their clips, but the editor here cannot delete those because they are they're, they're the master. Everything else is looked at like local clones. Mm. Yeah. Is, is other than that, other than looking at the the properties of the file and saying this is the master 4K, or like Carl showed, you could put a little watermark and say proxy, or you could put the user's name if you wanted to, right, any of that right, stuff. Okay. Um, it doesn't sort of automatically do it for you, but that's, okay. that's not a bad feature request. Yeah, that's yeah, a good feature request. All right, I don't want to uh, take up any more time here. Thank you guys so much.